This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. In the past few decades, there's been a resurgence of interest in so-called virtue ethics, the origins of which go back to Plato and Aristotle. The postage stamp version of moral philosophy, the version you get in Philosophy 101, goes something like this. Utilitarians claim that the morality of an action should be judged by its consequences. Kantians say consequences take second place to our duties and obligations, such as the duty not to lie. While virtue ethicists claim that both theories pay insufficient attention to character. According to the virtue theorist, the best action is not necessarily the one that produces the best consequences, or indeed the one that meets an obligation, but it's the one that would be carried out by a virtuous person. However, Oxford University's Roger Crisp argues that the differences between the various moral theories are not as clear-cut as most textbook authors suggest. Roger Crisp, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you. The topic we're considering today is virtue. Let's start with the question, what is virtue? Well, that's a very good question to begin with because it's the question that Plato began with. And as Whitehead said, all philosophy consists in footnotes to Plato. The question, what is virtue, is answered by Plato in different ways, in different dialogues, and in these dialogues he depicts Socrates as holding different positions. But essentially the project which Plato was trying to carry out was to plot the relations of the concept of virtue to certain other concepts, in particular the concepts of knowledge and the concepts of happiness. And to put it in a nutshell, Plato wanted to persuade his listeners or his readers, that virtue consists in knowledge. So all the virtues that we think of as different, in fact, consist in this one element, knowledge, and that human happiness is constituted by virtue in some sense or other. So being kind, for instance, is, in Plato or Socrates' view, a kind of knowing Yes, and there are different accounts of the kind of knowledge at stake. So if you read the dialogue of the Protagoras, for example, the knowledge there is hedonic knowledge. It's knowledge about how much pleasure and how much pain different actions are going to cause. But, of course, there are other sorts of accounts, more straightforwardly, the view that virtue consists in knowing what to do. Now, Aristotle is considered the expert on virtue and the virtues. How did he develop Plato's ideas? Well, I think that term develop is exactly right because I think he does take over the Socratic platonic agenda. The questions there are the questions that Plato was trying to answer. One thing that tends to happen in platonic dialogues is that a question will be asked, such as, for example, what is virtue or what is courage or what is piety? And pretty soon Socrates in the dialogue gets involved in more abstract or fundamental philosophical questions, like, for example, do these things have an essence? Can we learn what they are through looking at examples of them? And of course, many of the dialogues end in a state of puzzlement, whereas Aristotle tends to take these questions much more head-on. And he asks the question, what is virtue? And he gives us an answer. A virtue, according to Aristotle, is a disposition, in Greek a hexis, to perform certain actions and to feel certain feelings. Obviously virtues aren't just any old dispositions because I might have a disposition to be cruel. That's not a virtue. So what separates out the virtues from other kinds of dispositions? Well, that's where Aristotle's famous doctrine of the mean comes in because, according to him, the virtuous disposition is the disposition that leads you to perform those actions and to feel those feelings which are appropriate at that time. I think this would be easier to understand if we had an example, one of Aristotle's examples, perhaps. OK, let's take the virtue of even temper. So, according to Aristotle, the person with that virtue will feel the right amount of anger at the right time towards the right people for the right reasons and so on. Now, you might say, how is that a doctrine of the mean? What does this virtue lie between? Well, it lies between two vices, one of excess and one of deficiency. So, for example... If you're in a situation where you should be feeling angry and you don't, that's a vice of deficiency. It's a kind of insensitivity. There are some things that you should get angry about. Somebody insults one of your parents publicly. You should get angry about that. A more common vice, as anybody who drives a car in the city of Oxford will know, is the vice of excess, where people feel angry when they shouldn't. So somebody pulls in in front of them, having overtaken, you know, a few feet too short, and the person gets absolutely furious. Now that's another vice. So the person with the virtue is the person who always gets it right. 
So what you're saying is that the mean isn't synonymous with moderation. You don't have to be moderate in everything you do. You just have to be between the extremes. No, and Aristotle's view has, uh, over the centuries, been confused with that view very often. And that view is clearly crazy. There are times when you should be extremely angry. It's also important to remember that Aristotle's doctrine of the mean doesn't just apply to feelings. So it's been quite tempting for people to think it applies only to feelings and it's saying your feelings should be moderate. They should lie in the middle of some kind of quantitative spectrum. But it's absolutely clear it's not quantitative when he's talking about the right time. He's not saying if you should get angry at 3 o'clock, that's in a mean between getting angry at 2.30 and 3.30. He's saying you should feel the right amount for the circumstances towards the right people and so on. And it's the same with actions. So if we take another Aristotelian virtue, the virtue of generosity, which is mainly concerned with giving away money, the generous person is going to be the person who gives away the right amount of money at the right time for the right reasons and so on, and will get the deficient vice and the excessive vice as before. So the stingy person or the mean person is the person who doesn't do it when they should, and the prodigal person is the person who does it when they shouldn't. And what's especially interesting is that you can therefore have both vices, Somebody might be prodigal, that means they give away money when they shouldn't. When they're in the bar, they'll buy too many rounds for too many people. And then when the person comes round at the end of the night collecting for some worthy charity, they've got no money left, and that makes them stingy. So in contrast to Kant, who thinks that having goodwill is what matters most in ethics, Aristotle is saying that actions really count. Yeah, I think there's a very interesting contrast there between that strand of thought in Kant and Aristotle. Aristotle places even more weight on the idea of activity, and particularly successful activity, than we find in Plato. For Socrates and Plato, what matters is virtue, having this disposition, if we're going to call it that, For Aristotle, that isn't the case at all. The person who just has the disposition and never does the actions, perhaps because they're knocked over by a bus, just as they're about to start their virtuous career, as it were, for him, that person does not lead a happy life. What matters is achievement, performing virtuous actions. So quite a lot of the things that will determine whether or not I perform a successful action are actually outside my control. It's a bit of luck as to whether I'm the kind of person who is successful. That is absolutely right. In recent years, perhaps particularly in the work of Martha Nussbaum, there's been some very helpful discussion of the role of luck in ancient ethics. And I think it's not an overstatement to see a move towards the position of immunity from luck as being the ideal. So the Stoics, for example, wanted to persuade us that just being virtuous would give you everything you could possibly want, perfect happiness, even if you end up being tortured on the rack. Aristotle doesn't go quite that far. He asks the question, could it be that a great deal of bad luck actually makes you unhappy, given the important role of virtue in happiness? And he says, no, it couldn't. If you're virtuous, nothing could happen to you that would make you unhappy, but it could be that you become not happy. Exactly what he means by that is open to all sorts of interpretations. I take him to be saying that things could happen to you which put you in a position where you can no longer perform virtuous actions. You would if you could, but you can't. So you're not, as it were, accruing happiness. But that doesn't make you unhappy, because being unhappy consists in being vicious. And there's no reason why bad luck should make you vicious. When you were talking about Plato, you said that for Plato, virtue is knowledge. What did Aristotle think about that? Is knowledge an aspect of virtue for Aristotle? Well, as is rather characteristic of Aristotle, he finds some of the truth in that platonic position. But he denies that the virtues are purely knowledge. There is, as it were, a non-cognitive element to them, which consists in your having a disposition to react in the right way in certain circumstances. And this is something that just comes through training and habituation, which is why there's much more of a story about moral education in Aristotle's ethics than there is in the Platonic Dialogues, where actually the question, how do we get these virtues, to some extent fades away. But Aristotle thinks that these virtues, not purely non-cognitive, you have to have what he calls practical wisdom, this intellectual virtue that enables you to see what's called for in particular cases. And he claims that if you have any one virtue, you must have practical wisdom. And if you have practical wisdom, then you must have all of the virtues. So it can't be possible for somebody to have just some of the virtues and lack others. That sounds a bit odd to us now. I mean, surely somebody could be generous but irascible, for instance. It does sound odd, but I think there's an argument for it, which Philippa Foote brought out quite nicely. And that is that the virtues are, are in a sense, bounded by each other. So you might think that somebody is generous because they always seem to be giving away the right amount of money at the right time and so on. But then, in some circumstance, they get wound up by the person who's asking for the money when they shouldn't because they're irascible, and so they end up not giving the money, and that makes them stingy.
So all the virtues for Aristotle are integrated as part of the shaped character. Yes, and that's what people call the thesis of the reciprocity of the virtues as opposed to the Socratic thesis of the unity of the virtues. Modern virtue ethics goes back to Aristotle, but it's different. What's the difference? Two differences. One more abstract is that Aristotle talks a lot about individual virtues and vices, what he takes them to be and how they manifest themselves and so on. There's kind of lack of that in modern thought. And the second way in which there's a difference is just in the list. Modern virtue ethicists tend to be what you might call common sense moralists. Because of the lack of reflection upon the nature of particular virtues and vices by modern virtue ethicists, they're actually much closer to common sense than Aristotle himself was. And part of our common sense morality, a major component of our common sense morality, concerns the way we respond to the suffering of others and the advancing of others' well-being. And kindness, particularly in our post-Christian or Christian situation, is of course a central virtue. And that is entirely lacking in Aristotle. There is no virtue of kindness. Does that mean that virtue ethics is essentially a formal structure into which you can slot any virtue that happens to be locally valued? I think that's one way to see it, and it does seem to be one way that virtue ethicists describe themselves. So they'll say that, according to virtue ethics, the right action is the one that the virtuous person would perform. But that is, as you say, abstract, and you can plug any substantive content into that you like. So if you're of a utilitarian inclination and you think that people should produce the greatest good overall, you might say, look, the only virtue is benevolence or beneficence, producing happiness for others. You plug that into your abstract account of virtue ethics and you get something very close to utilitarianism. But of course what modern virtue ethicists do is plug in common sense morality. So they will say, of course there's not only one virtue, there's justice, courage, generosity... And, of course, beneficence. Does that mean that virtue theory, as it's currently discussed, is almost a form of relativism, moral relativism? I think in some forms it's close to that. The strand that's closest to relativism is probably Alastair McIntyre's in After Virtue. His account of the virtues is tied up with a complete account of rationality, according to which rationality emerges from traditions and practices and is, in a sense, relative to those traditions and practices because you cannot rise above those practices and survey them all from some Archimedean standpoint and decide that this one is better than that one because you could only do that with some of the values that you've, as it were, learned through being brought up in the practices you have been brought up in. So that's the old hermeneutic problem. Another strand really does go back to Aristotle, and this is what we find in Philippa Foote's book, Natural Goodness, where the idea is you look at human beings from a biological point of view and you find that for human beings to flourish, perhaps in any kind of community, they need certain virtues and they need to avoid certain vices. One of the standard ways of teaching moral theory is to divide moral philosophers into consequentialists, deontologists and virtue theorists. Do you think that is an adequate map of ethics or is there something wrong with that? I think it's pretty inadequate once you get past philosophy 101. Contemporary virtue ethicists will often say that what sets their views apart from the utilitarians and the Kantians and the contractarians and so on is that, according to them, the right action is the one that the virtuous person would do. Now, imagine some virtuous person performing some action and you go to ask them, why did you do that? They're not going to say, because I'm virtuous. They're not going to say, because it's the sort of thing that a virtuous person would do. They're going to say, because it was the right thing to do or because it was the kind thing to do, or the just thing to do, without any reference, as it were, to themselves or their own character. So myself, I think that Aristotle was quite right to claim that if you're going to give the proper account of character in ethics, you have to refer to actions. Roger Crisp, thank you very much. Thank you. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Mm-hmm.